Today's guest is Joshua Thomas, owner and operator of Legit Designs, that's legit with a J, a graphic design studio specializing in branding, illustration, murals, ultimately dedicated to the creation and development of meaningful stories through design. Josh, welcome today. Could you introduce yourself, give, your, give us a little more background on who you are and what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, so I am, as Tor mentioned, right, I'm Joshua Thomas. I own and operate a business called Legit Designs. Um, I like to call it a design studio, but it's just me. Um, Most uh, design studios are just me. That's yeah, just yeah. And you know, once you once you get into the industry, you'll realize that studio is just a word for uh, one guy or one girl or one whoever sitting in a room designing stuff. Um, uh, so and to give you a little bit of insight, right? It's legit with a J because my initials are J-I-T. It's not because I don't know how to spell legit, but everybody asks or misspells it in emails. Um, <laughs> you'd be surprised how many times I've got to rewrite that. Uh, so I went and graduated from Eastern Washington uh, with a degree in visual communications design, um, went on to get my master's. Uh, and then, you know, I started freelancing right after my bachelor's, but um, I also do UX design at a company called iTron um, that's, you know, here in Liberty Lake, but also international. Um, and then I do uh, my freelance stuff um, as well. So uh, I'm pretty much an open book. So if you have any other questions, I mean, you know, let me know. Yeah, well, so I'm sure autocorrect alone will mess up legit half the time. So <laughs> So, okay, so how did you get into graphic design? Like what sparked your interest there? I, you have a, a bachelor's in it, but what sparked your interest first? Uh, I feel like for most, you know, designers, artists, creatives, um, I think the things, the creativity we consume when we grow up is a big thing that drives us to create. Um, so, you know, I mean, cartoons, reading, comic books, anime, you know, all the different things that you consume over the course of your lifetime that make you go, ooh, I wonder if I could do that. You know, as simple as the times where you saw something on the screen, you're like, ooh, I'm gonna see if I can draw that, right? Um, and so for me, that was kind of how it all started, right? It was me drawing Mario or Yoshi for days and weeks or, uh, or creating Spider-Man costumes for myself um, growing up that, you know, were the kind of the impetus for me being interested in, you know, all things creative. And then truthfully, I mean, I didn't even decide that I was really going to get into like design to like a couple of weeks before I even went off to college, right? I had always just planned on going into like sports marketing or um, marketing in general, right? I knew I wanted to be somewhere creative, but more on the marketing side and then happened to just find visual communications and was like, oh no, this is it for me. This is the that's the one right there and it ran with it. Yeah. It well, so you, you've mentioned uh, Mario, you've mentioned Spider-Man. Was it the particular art of video games or comic books or something that, that drew yeah, you? Yeah, I would, I would definitely say for me, it would, it would be my pop culture influences that were, that were big for me. Um, even, even stuff is similar. Cause you know, I'm obviously very big into music. So like album covers and stuff like that, mm. like, graduation by Kanye West right one of you know one of my favorite album covers of all time right um and just getting to see stuff like that growing up you know that that sparked my interest oh, somebody has to make this right why can't I mean why can't I make this um and you know I'm nowhere near that level yet but you know thinking about it from a perspective of you know why did you get started it's seeing stuff like that right um the very first movie I ever saw in theaters was Spider-Man to date me, right, was Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire. That was the first movie uh, I ever yeah. saw in a movie theater, right? right. Um, and so I would definitely say that books and comics and TV and cartoons and all those kinds of things are a big, big reason. Video games, massive reason why I got into the space in the first place. I mean, it's a massive reason why I stay in the space, right? I love, you know, I love to consume that stuff. I mean, my walls are covered in pop culture references and things like that right. so um that's got i mean i i can't point it to anything else and i mean another piece would probably also be though um my parents always supported it from a young age too i mean i i, I have found that some parents aren't as you know supportive of a degree in the arts i mean we've we've all seen it right yep. um my parents were from a very young age um there was never a point where they didn't you know push me to continue to try to you know go down that path or 
um, you know, try to steer me down something, you know, that maybe wasn't, wasn't more me. I mean, my parents are the ones that showed me this degree in the first place, right? That told me, oh, this is, we think this might be something for you. Um, nice. And, you know, it was. So I, that support system was also a massive reason, you know, gave me the ability to feel like I had the room to, to grow in the space. Yeah, you know, I was a studio art major, mm -hmm. um, focused on graphic design and printmaking, but I did an accounting minor just in case the art thing didn't pan out. So, <laughs> <laughs> what do you but, think? Hey, what do you think my MBA is for? <laughs> well, we're going to get to that in a minute because yeah. I think that's a really interesting combination. Right? Yeah, <laughs> a visual arts degree and an MBA. That's yeah. that's interesting. So we're going to get to that in a minute, but. Um, so you mentioned that you're a freelance designer, you know, you're running your own studio and you also do this UX work with another company, but as a freelance designer, what is your, what is your day-to-day -day job like? Honestly, right. So wake up. I mean, I'll give you the, the real day-to-day, -day, right? So I have, typically I have a stand-up meeting for my UX work at about 7 a.m. every morning. So I'm up by like 6.30, right? Um, and I work from home um, and most of our, you know, most of the offices are India, North Carolina. So it's not like I'm going anywhere. Um, so that my day starts about then. But then after that, what I'll do is I'll typically check emails um, from clients. Um, and I've been reading a lot of stuff and we can get more into this later, but about, you know, productivity and, you know, how non-productive it is sometimes to start your day off with reading emails. Um, it's tough because it's, I mean, we all do it, right? I wake up, I check my messages on my phone. Very first thing that I do in the morning, or I check my emails. Um, but that's, so that's what I, I probably should do that less, but that's what I do, right? I check my emails to make sure, hey, is this client got back to me? Uh, have they checked this proof yet? Um, is there, you know, any feedback that I'm missing before I get my day started? Um, and then from there, I actually keep a physical planner um, with my bright pink pen. If you don't know this about me, um, which you probably don't, color is my... Sorry, my mom's calling me. One sec. Um, uh, color is my color is my world. So you'll see everything that I write is either in a bright pink or yellow or something, something that's not legible to the normal person. Um, but I'll I'll write down what I want to get done, write my tasks for the day. Um, I used to do it. A lot of people will use like Asana or something digitally, right? I found that working, you know, analog with a planner has helped me a ton to keep my days matched up. So I'll do that, write down the things I want to get done so I don't forget appointments and stuff. And then from there, just start chopping away at the things that I feel like from clients um, in order of most importance, right? Uh, you've got to, right? when you're juggling as many things as I am, right? You've got to, all right, this client needs this by this week. This client needs this by that week. All right, let's start with this, work some on that. And then I'll, um, I really like to get to a finishing point on a project before I move on to something else. So there'll be days, right, where I'll work on one project and might not get to another one um, by the, you know, by the end of the day, but I'll push it to the next day because I find it's a lot more beneficial to my workflow to get to a stopping point where I feel like my creative process has hit like, okay, I feel good about this. Um, then to stop, start something else, then go back, then go back to that and just, you know, until. Oh man, that's a creativity killer. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, you know, a lot of the times in, I've even told clients before, um, as, a, as a regards to deadlines and stuff that, hey, um, you know, I'm going to need uh, an extra couple hours, right? Because I was, you know, chopping away at something else. But in the long run, right, my creativity and the work I output is going to be better, allowing myself the time that I need for project to project. Um, but yeah, so that's, I mean, that's pretty much it. And then after that, right, after the day's over, um, I just started coaching basketball. So now, I go to coaching, but normally, you know, it's make dinner, hang out with the wife and then, you know, go to bed, watch, we're, watch we're, my, watch my shows, play video games. <laughs> absorb that pop culture we were just yep. talking about. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, work-life balance is really important. Right. Yep. Um, I think uh, a lot of up and coming designers feel like they got to do all the grinding all the time mm. um, in order to, you know, achieve something. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like you're, you're actually doing a good job of, of balancing that. And so I'm, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind exploring that a little more, like, how did you, like, how do you deal with clients, making sure you don't overload yourself? How do you even pitching and contracts, things like yeah, that? Yeah. I mean, there's, oh, and I, and I set aside, I've got a whole folder ready of stuff I can show you all. Um, just so you can kind of get a sense of, you know, how I go through my process and stuff like that. But 
Um, to answer your direct question, right? Um, I like working with clients and making sure that, you know, I don't overload myself. That's a, it's a challenge, right? Regularly, because again, I love money, right? I want to, I want to be paid for as much design work as I can do. Um, but realistically, right. The, you've got to also balance the level, right. The level of design work you're doing. Um, the more work you take on, something's got to suffer. Right. And a lot of the time it's the quality. Uh, so for me, a big help. And I tell everybody this, right. Charge what you're worth. That will, in and of itself, that will help you weed out a lot of stuff that you should just not be doing. And I've got, again, I've got friends and colleagues that don't charge what they're worth. And a lot of the times they're the same ones that are way overloaded with projects upon projects upon projects because they have to, right? Um, you get to a point where you've got to take on 10 low paying clients just to make ends meet as opposed to taking three high paying or, you know, quality paying clients and you're doing quality work that's not going to overload you because you're taking your creative mind in seven different directions right, right. um so that's a that's a big one right and i you're not going to believe me right you're not going to believe me <laughs> charge what you're worth i know it's scary and at first you're worried about not getting clients and at first right there's going to be a couple where if you're really excited about something you're going to take something that's really cheap we've all done it right we've all done it and when you're first starting it's understandable but the quicker that you can get to the point where you're charging what you know that you're worth, the better the better your work life balance will be, the better your business will go. Because again, you're going to be excited about what you're doing. Right. You feel like you're you're being paid for what you're worth. Um, and it's not it's not hard, it's not easy, right? I'm not going to pretend like it's easy to. I'm still trying to convince clients that I'm worth what I'm worth, right? Right. Um, it is we an have ongoing. A, we have battle. a question here. How do you deal yeah. with differences in opinions between you and the customer? Yep. That's right? a great question. Um, here's the thing. There is always, there's always a solution, right? It might not be the solution that's best for you. It might not be the solution that's best for your client, but there's always a solution, right? So let me give you an example. If a client comes to me um, and you'll get better at this as you go along, right? There's a there's certain rhetoric that you should be looking out for that you can kind of tell, no offense, this guy's broke. He's not paying, he's not going to be paying me what I'm worth to be paid for, Right. Um, and there's a lot of rhetoric and here's the thing, nothing to that, right? There's a lot of startups that don't have any capital off, you know, off the jump or they're using it for different places. There's nothing to, nothing to knock that, but, um, the quicker you can pick up on that, the quicker you can avoid wasting your time doing pricing proposals, drawing up contracts, all this stuff for a client that, I mean, between us, we know he's not, he or she, um, or they are not worth your time, right? They're not going to, they're not going to, you know, hit, cut the, cut the mark, but, um, I will point clients in another direction entirely. If, if I feel like I'm just not right, it doesn't fit my, my budget, what I'm worth. I'll tell a client, absolutely. Well, I have, you know, there might be somebody that I can point you to, or how you know, many times I've pointed a client to a logo generator. I have no shame about that. There is a spot for it. There's a spot for it. A lot, a lot of designers are afraid of, you know, the prevalence of logo generators. Nah, I will, I'll tell a client flat out to their face, if you, here's the thing, it's, well, and here's the thing, it's more polite than me saying, then why don't you just do it yourself? You know how many times I have a client come to me and this, this will happen to all of you, right? You know how many times I have a client that comes to me and goes, well, I mean, I've done most of the work. I've done all yeah. the conception. I just need you. I just need somebody to put it together in Illustrator. I was like, well, then do it yourself. Right. I, I have sent clients classes on Illustrator and no, I have sent them classes, Illustrator said, here's a class on Adobe Illustrator. If you, again, you, you know what, this is going to, this costs you 10 bucks. And then you can do it all yourself for the rest of your life. Right. You're not paying me to be a set of hands. That's the, the biggest advice I can give all of you, right? You're not a set of hands. Clients don't pay you to be a set of hands. If you're being paid to be a set of hands, anybody can do that. They're paying you to be you. They're, they're paying you for your expertise in your mind, your creative mind, right? Mm -hmm. um, but don't be afraid to point them in another direction. If, if you're not the right person for that job or they're not the right client for you, right? They don't, they don't, they're not paying the right amount. Here's a, here's a logo generator, um, go there. And then the beauty of it is they, they are, they are more likely to come back to you because when they inevitably are unhappy with whatever crap they get from the logo generator, right. They are more likely to come back to you because they felt like you were, you were giving them the sweet deal, right. You were helping them get to a point where they felt, Oh, I'm, I, I'm ready to go. Right. And then they come back to you when they actually have the capital to pay you. And now you're doing a rebrand. You might not. I mean, again, right. in the grand scheme of things, the, it's 
I tell clients all the time, you're wasting your time. You're going to come back to me. I have had so many clients come back to me and go, okay, now can we do the rebrand? Yeah. Absolutely. Here's can what you it fix costs. this for me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And again, uh, sometimes it's just how it works. And Maren's asking a question here. Have you ever had to deny a client services just outright? Just outright, just, oh, it won't work for you? Well, I added the word outright, but yeah. Yeah. Um, mul yeah, multiple times. I mean, when I was first starting, right, that, that, trigger, that trigger finger for yes was real easy to have, right? Because you feel like, oh, th this could be the one. Um, patience is so key in this. Patience is so key. Um, there have been, there have been plenty of clients where it's just been, you know, the, the more you talk to them, the more you're like, no, I'm just not working for you. And I've been burnt a couple times. Um, that taught me that lesson, right? Um, mm. it's, it's real hard. It's really hard when, especially when there are sometimes you've got a client that's paying the right amount of money, but they're just not the right client for you. Right. That's the most difficult one. Um, I had one client, that I did branding for, and I'm not under an NDA or anything, so I don't care. Um, the, they're called Epic Gamers. And so they're, it's a company out of oh, somewhere, it was somewhere foreign, right? But they're a gaming company. They sold like monitors and mouses and stuff like that, um, mice and stuff like that. But I started the project with them, you know, contract and everything probably March, worked with them for like two months, and then radio silence for literally half a year from them. Wow. Nothing. Right. And then they would, they came back, right. We're like, all right, where's the, where's the, where's the stuff. And I'm, I'm not the average designer. So I, I'll straight up just go, Oh no, I haven't been working on that for months. Like if you're again, after I send you three emails, I got the hint. I'm right. working on other shit. Like I just, <laughs> I'm not going to waste my time. If you're not going to waste your time, I'm not going to waste my time. So um, that's it's got to be important right? to the client too. It's got to be important to the client. And the, the beauty of it is there's always a polite way to say no. Right. I think a lot of people get in trouble as they feel like in order to say no to a client, they've got to like cuss them out over, over email or phone or something. You don't have to, again, it's a very simple, you know, this doesn't, this does not fit my, um, you know, my parameters for what I, what I need out of my clients. Um, I, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to decline this offer. Right. I've done that plenty of times. Um, I'm too busy to complete this in the timeline you need. Yeah. I mean, I mean here's, and here's the other thing, right? If for some reason you feel super uncomfortable, make an excuse up there. They don't, they don't know if you're not going to be working for them. It doesn't matter what the reason is, is the bottom line. A lot of designers get, un, get worried about, <laughs> offending people right it's it's your it's your social contract people are so worried about being feeling awkward or, or offending somebody at the end of the day right you're the one with the service they're coming to you for a right. service if right. you don't feel like giving that service tell them you don't feel like giving that service um right. i would say the only the only caveat there is just make sure you do it in a professional manner professionalism is what's going to get you more and more clients but well, you don't want to burn a bridge yeah I had plenty of clients, right? Like I said, I've had plenty of clients that the first project didn't work out. But then two, three, four months later, they've come back and like, you know, I actually have a different project or the same project. You know, we right. have the capital or, or this will work. Um, don't allow people to change your terms, right? If they're, right. if they're what you, if your terms have been set for a reason, um, because it, you know, it's what you need for your work-life balance, or it's what you need to be the most creative as you can. Don't allow other people to set your terms. Um, when you're first starting, it's hard, to, it's hard to keep that boundary, but the quicker you get there, the better off you'll be. So we're getting a bunch of questions stacked up here, but I'm going to ask one first. Yeah. Um, I'm going to push back on something because there's this common thing in the design industry for like a new designer mm -hmm. that they should start doing cheap work or even free work to yep. build up their portfolio. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I've heard it. Yeah. What do you, what do you say to that? Um, one, I say that is a uh, method that people who don't want to pay us what we're worth have used for generations to not pay us what, what we're worth. <laughs> um, it's, I feel the same way about that as I feel about uh, free internships. So I think it, pardon my friends, but I think it's bullshit, right? I think, and this is just coming from my own experience because 
I know myself and I know a lot of, you know, my colleagues and peers and stuff like that, the level of work that I'm doing, even in an internship, right, is still work that you're going to be using. Why are you not paying me for that? I understand the idea that, you know, you're, I'm learning the work, the work atmosphere and things like that. I learn the, I learn the work atmosphere when I'm bagging groceries at Albertsons, but they pay me. I feel like my, I'm doing an actual skill here and you're not paying me, but I, so I feel very similarly about doing free work when you're first starting. Um, that being said, right, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that, say, there's something specific you want to get into, like you want to do album covers specifically. I'm not saying that if the right opportunity comes up to you and you have the time and it's not going to affect your mental state. Or your, or your life, right? And you feel like you have the capacity to take on some free work. Um, I'm not going to tell you that that's not something that you should do, right? If you feel like it's a passion and it's you, you think it might be your foot into the door to an industry that you'd like, because it's, you know, it's a, it's a real project, it's a real client, and you've not been getting paid work in this, in this area. Um, I'm not going to tell you not to do that. I'll tell you as soon as you can get paying clients, you should, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I would love to also mo monetary payment doesn't always have to be the only answer, right? Especially when you're first starting, you can trade services. Um, I would argue you, right. Find literally anything that you could be trading for your service, because at least then you, you and the client are getting into the mindset that this is not free. It might be free monetarily, but it's not a free service. They are also giving something, whatever right. that may, you know, if they work at a store, I want a 15% discount. I don't care what that thing is that they are giving you for your service. If you can squeeze anything out of that transaction, if you know if they just don't have the capital for it, if you can squeeze anything out of that transaction, I would say you should do it. Get paid for what you're worth. Um, because even, even when you're bad at design, you're better than the client, obviously, because <laughs> they're coming to you to right. do it. <laughs> so... Um, do you think even when you're doing free work, uh, you should have a contract? I always tell everybody you should have a contract whenever you work with anybody. Um, and it's not for all the, it's not for the five, six years that you have nothing ever go wrong. It's for the one day that you have a client try to screw you over and you don't have a contract. Um, I, I just had a family friend that got screwed out of a car dealership for hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Because he was not on contract. He was told, oh, once I flip this car dealership around, right? Bring it back up to profitable. Um, you're going to give this to me, right? You're going to, I'm going to be the owner of the car dealership. Guy was like, yeah, absolutely. But there's no contract. Sure enough, as soon as he got it back into the green, he said, nah, forget you. This is my dealership now. And there's not, again, your sad part, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you could get on social media and try to put them on blast and stuff, but legally there's- right it's a handshake deal. Like, uh, it's, well, it's, yeah. so I and tell people all the time, uh, good faith, good faith is great. Contracts yeah. are better. <laughs> and, uh, also contracts help define the scope of what it is you're actually giving somebody and yeah. what they're giving you in exchange, yeah. right? That whole thing Absolutely. where you're doing a trade of services or, or goods or whatever it is, instead of money, that really ought to be specked out clearly, yeah. Yes. And it so doesn't always have to be in the form of a contract. You, you finish the work and you're like, so I did it. And they don't be like, I, I had this when I was a young designer. Yeah. You know, they said, oh, we also have to do this other stuff as part of the job. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like you literally never mentioned before that you needed postcards with this campaign. Yeah. And they're like, oh, but, it, you know, it was part of the plan all along. And and. I, my con I had a contract, but it was so badly written that it, it, it was kind of an open end thing. Um, and so like, they weren't going to pay me unless I did it. So of course I did it because I needed the money, but I yeah. fixed my contract after that. <laughs> well, we've all, well, again, you know how many addendums I've had to my contract based on just experiences that I've gone, well, guess that's got to go in the contract. You know, clients, right. clients waiting months after projects to pay. Yeah, I tell you that I, that shit happened once to me and it was in my contract. The next the next client I had, if you do not pay within 30 days of a project's deliverable. Right. That's going to be five percent for every single day that I'm not paid after 30 days. And you know what? Not had a client be late yet. So <laughs> I think, there you go. again, there, the funny pieces is, is contracts. 
and I was uh, Tor and I were talking about this, you know, a, a few weeks ago, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I have had no. There is no way that over the amount of you know the amount of money that most projects are that it would be worth the legal fees for me to a- actually go to court over a lot of this stuff. Most people, once they feel like they're under contract, will just keep under contract because it's a contract, right? Right. It's it's truly in some it's to some extent it's a little bit of a of a of a blank threat, right? I'm probably never gonna go go to court over any of this stuff, mostly because I just don't have the time. All right, I just don't have the time for it. But the simple act of having the contract keeps people on their p's and q's because they feel like it's serious, right? And that's again, that's another reason having a contract legitimizes you a little bit. Um, yeah. You know, the first, if I'm, you know, and this is just me being candid with you all, right? If I'm a business owner and I've got this young designer that's coming and I, and I can go, oh, hey, I need to do this work and they don't present me with a contract or anything, it's a lot easier for me to feel like this isn't a legitimate business. This is just something he, you know, it's a hobby for them, right? right. Um, the more things that you can do to make yourself feel and seem professional, even if you don't yourself feel that way, right? The better. Um, it's better for their perception because again, your clients are then going to start going, oh, whoa, contract. Ooh, this is a, this is a business. Well, it helps the client be more serious too. Yeah. Because there's a lot of times a client isn't actually that serious yeah. or committed to what the deliverables are and how much money they're willing to commit. Because if it's all fuzzy, you're just doing it verbally or even by text message, a text message is not a contract. It's maybe nope. a tiny bit more than a, than verbal, but not much. There are some cases where you can use emails as um, verbal contracts. It's loose. I would argue you, if you're at that point, just use a contract. Have a real contract, yeah. right? Yeah. You you don't want. I don't want any of you to be in a situation where you're not under contract and you're having to scrounge around for evidence of why, why this is the scope or why they should be paying you or why, why, why? Because again, right. here's the thing, that's not your service. You're not a lawyer. Right. Take all of the necessary steps to take out all of those other you know, intangible items so that you can focus on what you're supposed to be good at, right? Designing, designing, drawing, right? Whatever, whatever your creative avenue is, allow yourself the freedom to do that thing uninhibited by... Yeah contract work chasing down clients for payments and or or just chasing down no-show clients that aren't even you know you'll do work and then they won't give you feedback right right the one thing that i can guarantee is if you have a a contract very few times are you going to have a client that is just going to no-show ghost you right i have i mean to this day i have a client that owes me and that's fine mine like a steel trap i have a client right now that owes me twelve hundred dollars of work back literally like three years ago that I, that just all this in the funny pieces is here's what I'll, here's another, here's an excellent example of why you should use a contract. This was a client that I'd been working with for almost a year on good faith, right? We knew each other. I'd been over to his house. We'd been out to dinner, all of these different things, right? I'd met his wife, all this great stuff, right? To the point where you would think, right? Oh, I don't, I don't need a contract. He's a good guy. He's good for it. He's paid me seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times before. And then all of a sudden, one time I had, you know, sent the work, have not heard from him since. To this day, have not heard from him since, have not been paid. Again, you think I'm joking. I'm not joking. People are dirtbags. Clients do not, again, if they don't have to, they'll do everything they can most of the time not to pay you. So it's not, it's, again, I have so many great clients now, but just there are some, there's some assholes out there, right? There are some people yeah. that will literally, literally treat you well for a year and then just completely ghost you not and yeah. here's the funny piece to me right i i'm one of those people that if a client a client has ever come to me and said hey something happened to my business or i've had a family issue right i don't have the money for this right now i am the first person to go absolutely let's work out a payment plan um what what can you do um yeah. or here's the let's thing i would even prefer yeah i would even prefer you giving me a heads up and just saying hey i can't pay you at least then I know right. the, the simple act of just like not saying anything is so scummy to me that <laughs> it's on, it's up. It bothers me. It's like a human to human interaction because here's the thing, be human enough to look me in my eyes and tell me you're not going to pay me at least. Right. So there's a ton of awesome questions in the text chat. I don't think we're going to get to all of them, 
Um, but I see them all. Thank you for all that. Um, a couple of them I am going to circle back to, but I, I, we talked about contracts before. Yeah. Um, you have an MBA, yep. which is unusual for a designer. Yep. So what is your MBA in? And then do you, can you share some of your contract advice, like some practical pointers or even show us a contract? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my MBA, it's con my concentrations in finance, um, which to be fair, I found out about like in my last class. I was like, oh, I've got a concentration in finance. Sweet. I was wondering why I was taking so many finance courses. Um, but so that's what my that's what my MBA is in. Um, advice from a contract perspective. What I've kind of found is two things, right? Um, short and sweet is always the best, right? Especially in our field. Um, mostly because having to wait weeks for clients to review long contracts um, with a lot of fluff, a lot of stuff that you, you know, to be honest, don't really need. And I'll, and I'll show you, I'll pull it up um, right now, actually. But having a lot of fluff in there, um, stuff in, and here's the, here's the crazy piece. A lot of that stuff you won't know, you don't need or need until, you know, it's <laughs> until you do it. But the beauty, let's see, finder. So here's an example of one of the, you know, one of the first contracts, right? I was working with. It was like, a, it was a very simple word document. It's wordy, right? And it's got a lot of legal jargon in there. Um, because at the time, I didn't know enough to go, well, I, yeah, this is something, this is stock. Let me just use this because it makes me feel comfortable, right? It's a couple pages. It's still got your, your base level information, right? Copyright stuff. Um, I would say the biggest pieces to include, and let's go to the second. So this is the contract I use now, right? I simplified it down to one page. Um, I try to make sure that I focus on the biggest things that need to be focused on. Like, when should they pay me? Um, mm -hmm. what, are, what are your copyright? And this is for a mural. So this is a little different. And that's the other thing I tell you is a lot of the, based on what your discipline is, you're going to have some different, um, like, you know, contract specs. Uh, you might have, like for a mural, right? I specified in here, you're not allowed to reproduce the mural and sell it in like print forms. Hmm. like uh, things that things that you should probably think about because here's the thing you might not think a client would ever do it but i shit you not if you don't think they'll do it they'll do it eventually oh, yeah. um yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would cover your bases um also talking about stuff another one that's a big one especially as you start working with um clients that have you know bigger businesses make sure that a lot of the times in your contracts you have something in there that specifies if a client gives you something that's copyrighted and that they don't have the rights for, that you are not responsible for that, for putting that into the design. Um, that's a big one that, and I'm sure, again, plagiarism is no joke. Copyrights are no joke. Um, yeah. Making sure that your clients are the ones that are responsible. Cause you know, I take the responsibility that the work that I do is my own work, but making sure that you're not going to get tripped up by a client that did not have the same level of professionalism is key. Um, I, you know, I, I'd hate to see that level of angst over a client that gave you the Mickey Mouse symbol, and then they didn't actually get that cleared by Disney, but you used it, right? Like I work for HoopFest, the Nike swoosh. I, I'm allowed to use that in designs, but that's HoopFest who has the copyright, but I make sure that they understand that me using that in my designs is that that copyright is for them. That's not on right. me. Not if you. I use it and Nike comes down and they go, you can't put that on your shirts. I go, go talk to HoopFest. <laughs> That's, right. I was not the one that was get, given that. Um, and here's the contract to point you to it. Um, right. The other piece, right? Obviously payment. Um, I would say termination is another big one. Making sure that if you, and you're allowed to terminate project too. People, designers feel like they're not allowed to terminate projects. You're allowed to terminate project early. If you just, if this client is just giving you the business, right? Fire yeah. them. It feels real good to fire clients. I'm not going to lie. It feels really great. So- <laughs> It does. You do not have to feel like you're, you're tied in. Yes. Um, so again, you're making sure that you also have the have the terms in there. They're like, what happens in termination? If right. I've completed the full project and then you terminate it the day after, no, you still have to pay me. Like, and that's right. how I do it, right? Um, yeah. You need upfront milestones. payment and you need a kill fee potentially. Yep. A, a quote unquote kill fee. Yep. 
Yes, um, I also say, yeah, not, that's a, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I'm going to take this off because we're done talking about it. But um, uh, what am I doing? Oh, stop share. There we go. Um, get upfront payment whenever you can, right? Um, you know, some, some projects don't lend themselves to it, depending on your discipline again. But for any project that you can get an upfront payment, I do 25%. Um, that, whatever that amount is, it's up to you. I like 25% because, you know, a lot of the times it, it one allows me any expenses that I might have to incur, like to get the project done, talking about like buying typography, stuff like that. Um, I don't have to worry about. And I'll also, I mean, you'll, you might have seen in that contract, I specified in there that they were paying for paint. Um, they right. were paying for tarps. Like there are some expenses that I do make clients reimburse me for, but um, I would say anything that you can get up front as just a, a good faith down payment is always best because it's another thing that typically keeps a client in the game because they have skin in the game. Now I've already right. paid them $250. I might as well finish this out, you know? Right. Um, so, so there are uh, organizations like the AIGA or the graphic artist guild, which have material, whether it's online or, or, uh, what is it? Graphic artist guild pricing and ethical guidelines handbook. Okay. Um, do you recommend those? Are those useful for students trying to figure out some of these contract issues? Absolutely. I have, that was the first client or the first contract I had is from the, let me see what edition it is. Cause I have the 15th, the 15th edition is what that first contract literally yeah. copy and paste from the 15th edition of and the graphic right. artist handbook. Yeah. I think they're up to the 16th edition. Now I'm looking on my shelf and I have the 14th edition. Actually, wait, I'm wrong. It's from this book. Business and legal forms. This book, this book right here, this thing saved me a long, a lot of, a lot of hardship. Um, business and legal forms for graphic designers. That first contract I had was, you know, pretty much copy and pasted, this is, and they'll. This is a graphic artist. Yep. <laughs> book, fourteenth edition. Um, we have been talking a lot about contracts, folks, but the simple fact is. I never learned about contracts in any of my education, not in undergrad, yep. in art design, not in graduate school, at an art school, right? It was all stuff I had to learn kind of the hard way and through reading and books and talking to people in the business who had done it, just like we're doing now. Um, but unfortunately, it's a really important aspect. Like the business of design is how you pay your bills so you can live your life. I mean- yep you got to make money at this. Yep. Uh, it's, it, it becomes a little different if you're in an in-house agency, right? Then, yes. then there's an account rep or there's somebody else taking care of it. But when you're a freelancer or running your own studio, you get, you got to figure this stuff out. Absolutely. So th there are two or three questions here about um, how did you figure out your pricing? That's a great one. Um, again, Graphic Artist Handbook is great. Right. Um, just again, a lot of it is also asking, right? You're doing the right thing, asking designers what they charge. Um, because getting a sense of where you feel like you're at in comparison to other designers is a big piece of why you think you should be priced that way. There are so many books, so many books on design pricing. It's the it's the you know quintessential question for artists because we live in such an, an intangible financial world because of uh, the level of our work can be so. Um, objective, right? Uh, what What is the Mona Lisa worth compared to, you know, uh, you know, Rembrandt, right? Like it, it's that kind of thing. We live in a world where there are no finite prices. It's not like plumbing. Uh, we're, right, you know, right. we, our, our output is different every single time. Um, so what I would say is hourly helps. I do not charge by the hour. And I would tell you don't charge by the hour because most of the time it ends up being worse for you and the client because you'll either one, start padding your hours saying that you're working more hours than it actually needs you to work because the better you get, the faster you'll get. And then the for less sure. you'll be paid if you're charging hourly. But if you're talking about, um, like for me, whenever I think about a project, I charge by the project. So I go, how many hours do I think of actual sitting down and working, right? Not just like, oh, nine to five. I mean, like actually sitting down and working hours, uh, would it take me to complete this project? And then I go, okay, I charge $100 an hour, right? then that's, that's my project price. You know, multiply the, the hourly price that I set for myself by the, the number of hours I think it's going to be to complete. And maybe I'll add a little bit on it as well. 
here's the thing I tell you, right? Sometimes if you've got, if you've got clients and you don't need the, need the money, sometimes just see if they'll pay you more. And that it sounds, it sounds kind of, it sounds messed up, but here's the, here's the thing. The only way you're going to know what you're worth is if you push that boundary. Oh, wow. This client is willing to pay me 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 7,000. What, let me tell you this, that first time you get a $7,000 job, you'll go, holy, holy shit. Yeah. I, they're going to pay me to do what? Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's, again, Wait, you, don't get, you don't, yeah, you don't get there until you, you know, you slightly push that envelope, you slightly push that envelope. I have a, I have a friend that's literally been charging like 25, $50 an hour. And he's, he's got way more experience than I do. I charge double what he charges and I'm, I'm, you know, 15 years less experience, but he's afraid of not getting work. Well, if I, I don't want price to be the reason, sometimes price needs to be the reason there will be more clients. That's the funny piece. You think there won't, there will be more clients. Well, it's funny. I, I was thinking about some of the freelance projects I did years ago. Um, There was a project I did not want to do. So I quoted, but like, it was kind of a cool project, but I didn't really like the people. So I quoted yeah. them this insanely high price. Cause yeah. I was like, there's no way they're gonna, yeah. And they took it. I'm like, yeah, what? exactly. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes again, Hey, and sometimes a client will go, Oh, that's way too much. And you have to go, here's the thing. And sometimes there's nothing to say that you can't negotiate. I'd say have a strong arm, right? Don't let them negotiate you less than what you're, whatever the least amount of money you're willing to do a job for. Right. I don't even talk to clients now that, again, if, if, if the project's going to be, depending on what it is, right, even if it's something simple, the project's going to be less than $500. Typically, I'm just like, eh, no, it's not worth my time. It's just not. Um, now, even, you know, even simple, hey, can you edit this photo real quick? No. Like stuff that I could literally do in five minutes, I just go, no, it's just not. I could be spending this doing something else. But it's never just five minutes. No, it's oh, that's never the just those five are, minutes. Those are the those are the projects that end up being month long projects because they want they want fifty versions, and right. that again the, another reason every time, even when you think the project is easy, contract it up, contract it up, have a scope set because I if you give them it if you've ever read to get if you give a mouse a cookie, clients are literally that that is yeah all, they are that mouse. They totally. are that mouse. If you give them a cookie, they're going to want milk. Yep. I have, I have a client right now that I'm working with. That's, I'm doing a, a, a logo, a single logo and packaging design for. And I gave them, again, I gave them the quote for what it would cost to do a single logo. I told them why I wouldn't suggest it, um, why I you know suggest doing a full branding and stuff like that. And then you know, gave them the full price for both. They decided to go with this. And clients will try to tell you, oh, I want to do a single logo because they think they're going to get just a single logo. And then you're going to also give them some additions. Don't. If you tell them you're doing a single logo, do a single logo. And I'm just telling you that because you're going to want to. You don't think that I came up with a single logo and then built out the entire rest of the brand just because that's how my mind works? Yes, that's exactly what I did. Will I tell the client that? Absolutely not. They didn't pay me for that. Well, and if they want to pay you for that, then that's another contract. And, and again, every time that I work with them, I go, oh, you know, you, you work those things in, right? Oh, when, when you're ready to, when you're ready to build out the rest of the brand, I think I've got some ideas when you're ready to blah, 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 you know, setting that rhetoric early so that you, again, hopefully you're building repeat business. A lot of the clients that I have now are repeat business. That's good. So there's a couple other questions in here about dealing with uh, clients who give negative feedback. Mm -hmm. And how you deal with, with that. I mean, yeah. positive feedback is always awesome. Yep. But how do you deal with negative feedback um, and like measuring the success of the, the relationship and so on? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I would say is feedback is like the biggest part of the process, right? Um, having a client sign off on something feels awesome. Having a client not like something feels equally as awful. <laughs> um, yeah. But I would say checking your ego is the biggest thing. The more you do this, the bigger your ego gets. The more clients tell you that this is good work, the more, the bigger your ego gets. Um, you have to consistently check your ego because sometimes it's not necessarily that the work you're doing isn't good. 
it's that it's not right for the project or it's not right for the um for the uh the audience and i can give an example of that um i don't know how much time you guys have i have plenty of time i don't want to take all of your time but if you want to i have a project that i can go through with you later that i has an excellent example of a direction that i thought was awesome it was great work but it did not fit what the client felt the audience needed well so it's it, we have like 10 more minutes in the allotted hour okay. but i can stay a little after that and we can record stuff even if people can't stay okay perfect is that yeah. work yeah that works perfectly for me um okay. but basically right to continue on with that um getting negative feedback there are some times where I feel like you should push back as your as the expert. If you truly feel like this is the best solution for you, for the client, be able to explain your design solutions. That's the biggest key, that's the biggest advice I could give you is be able to explain your design solutions. You don't want to be caught with a client going giving you negative feedback and you really like it but you don't know why you made the decisions you made because then you have no leg to stand on. I'm not telling you that every time a client gives you negative feedback, they're right. I've had some clients that have, that I've given what I felt like was shitty work because that's what they wanted, right? They wanted something that was different than what I felt the vision should have been. And at the end of the day, right, they're paying you, they are the client, but I have, you know, there are so many projects that I've never let seen the light of day that I've oh. done, but I would never claim. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, um, there's, there's a, a lesson I do early on in one of my classes where I go through a logo development process from yep. my past work. Yep. And I'm like, okay, so the first round of designs never leaves the office. Like this was on a team, but it's like, we're putting all of our designs together and some of them are complete crap. The client will never ever see these, right? Because if we showed it to them, you know what? They would pick one, Yep. you know? <laughs> yep. A lot of, again, I, I, it's twofold. I have been taught by uh, so many mentors, right? Don't show clients work that you wouldn't be happy with them picking because they exactly. will always pick the shitty one, right? They, they always will. will. Um, there are some clients, right? Depending on, some clients have design backgrounds. There are some clients that also love to be a part of the story building process. So they like to see sketches. They like to, I've had plenty of clients that, uh, that like to see that process. Um, you've got to pick and choose. Mm -hmm. you've got to be better about understanding which clients are the right ones to do that with and which ones aren't. And you'll, you'll, the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. Um, but there are some that like to see that process, but absolutely. I think, you know, to try to hopefully button up my advice on getting negative feedback, there's a time to fight it. And there's a time to not, if you feel like it's valid feedback and valid criticism, and that's the biggest piece you need to be able to self-reflect. You've got to be able to separate yourself from the designs from your baby and look at it objectively and go, hey, maybe this client has something that maybe they're onto something here, right? And the funny piece is, is sometimes you might initially feel like, no, this is it. This is the perfect design, but then keep exploring based on the feedback. And you might find something that actually you like 10 times better. I've done that a lot. You've got to be able to separate yourself from your ego and from your baby and look at it objectively. And if you can do that and still feel like, no, I still feel like this is the, the best solution, be able to voice why you feel like that's the best solution and maybe be able to come to a, a, you know, some sort of compromise with your client, melding what their feedback was and what you feel like is the best vision. Um, I think communication is the key to that. Communication is the key to getting negative feedback and doing something with it that's, you know, beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of students here, okay, so first of all, there's a ton of great questions here. There is no way we're gonna get to all of them, but I see your <laughs> questions. Thank you for asking them, that's awesome. I'm actually saving them all and I, I may put them together and send them to Josh just yep. to say, hey, can you answer these by email? Yep, um, I will but, absolutely do that. But all of these, all of the students here are taking design classes with an eye for working in that in some capacity. We've got uh, Timmy here who's in marketing and minoring in DTC in, in our department, um, but you know, others are graphic designers, media designers, and so on. How do you start? Like, how do you get your foot in the door? Um, what are the tools you got to make sure you have lined up so that that's you can launch question. well? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, okay, so this is multifaceted, right? So <laughs> I would say that, yeah, it's difficult, right? There, a lot of people will tell you conferences. 
a lot of people will tell you, and here's the funny piece. I started before COVID, right? So conferences, in-person conferences were still a thing. So yeah. that was like a big one. Oh, you should be going to design conferences. You should be going to marketing conference. You should be going to all these conferences and networking, right? Um, that's not as, not as viable now. Um, the things that I found work the best for me, I found were one, right? As much as I hate it, as much as I hate it, um, social media can be nice sometimes. Um, be careful with it. You can end up, you know, feeling like your worth as a designer is directly connected to likes that you get. It's not, trust me. Um, I have like 450 um, followers on Instagram and I make a lot more money than what you would think a 450 follower designer has. So it is not a, it is not indicative of the level of success that you have. Um, I would say that that can be helpful for getting your name out sometimes, especially if you're like an illustrator or something like that. Showing your work is always key. Your work's got to be out there in some capacity. Um, I would also say networking can be beneficial. Cold calling and stuff like that done properly sometimes can be beneficial. Um, I didn't have a ton of success with it. Sometimes I did, right? But very rarely do people respond well to a random person reaching out to them and going, hey, I'm a designer. Would you like design work? Um, a lot of stuff can end up being who you know, which is why networking can be really nice. But you'd be surprised by just in the small circle of friends and family and stuff like that that you have, um, how they can be helpful in you getting your first few clients. Um, a website is big. Somewhere to point people to see your work mm -hmm that you, you somewhat own. Um, and I use Webflow. Before that, I used Wix. Before that, I had a really, really crappy like JavaScript site. Again, having something, it doesn't have to be perfect to start with. You, five There's years later, you're going to look at it. Yeah, you're going to look at it and you're going to hate it. And you're, then you're going to want to redo it. And then you're not going to have the time to redo it because you're working. But um, that was, I would tell you have a website somewhere you can point people um, and then there are plenty of like, like dribble. Um, what is it? Behance, like things work like for that. you, Behance, stuff like that, where you, you know, online messaging boards that have clients and projects and stuff like that. I have not, I'll tell you, I haven't gotten or taken a project off of dribble for probably a year or two now um, because I just, I haven't needed to. Um, I don't really love it because a lot of the times you'll get client. That's, it, it, it shoots your, shoots your faith in humanity a little bit because you have a lot of clients that'll just post on dribble. I need a logo really quick, $50. Right. Uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff on there. that's not worth your time. I also don't love the having to fight 50 billion designers, um, you know, for one project. Like it's, it's not, it's not designer beneficial. I would say a lot of those sites. It's client, it puts all the power in the client's hands because they can look at 80 right. different dribble. And I don't, I don't even have a, a curated dribble feed. I, it's, I don't, I don't see the benefit. People who have great dribble feeds, you know, they're going to get, they're going to probably get a lot of work on there because people look at it. Um, but it's not always indicative of the person that can do the best, have the best solution. Right. Um, so I would, I would say that Using it sparingly when you're first starting out can be beneficial, help you get a few, a few projects, you know, real, real projects, stuff like that. Um, and then having a website where you can kind of showcase some of that stuff. And I would also say another big thing is as much as you can legitimize yourself, um, both on your website or just on your social media presences or just out there in general, the better. And what I mean by that is treat your business like it's an actual business. You know, when you're sharing stuff, share case studies, share why you made design decisions, put yourself at a, at a position and uh, that makes people feel like you are an expert in the space. Even if you're not an expert, there is a level of this that is fake it till you make it. There is, there truly is. You got to market yourself. Yes. You've got to market yourself. And a lot of that is, Hey, I, I, this is a, this is a project that I did. This is why I chose the decisions. Oh, here's some early sketches. Here's, you know, what we ended up coming up with, blah, blah, blah. A lot of people, you'll get clients that'll come back to you and go, oh yeah, that's really, that's really cool. I really like that. I like your process. Will you work with me also? Hey, I just want to point out it is one o'clock. So if folks okay. got to head out, uh, that's cool. 
Um, thank you everyone for attending who could make it. If you can hang out for a few more minutes, um, I've got like 10, 15 minutes I can spare. Um, and maybe we can hit a couple more questions or you said there was a, a, a process, a, a product, excuse me, something you were working on. You wanted to walk yeah. through. Or, or yeah, I can, through. I can walk through that if you want to see that and you can ask questions while we're doing that. So, um, you know, a couple people have asked either publicly or even privately to me here, uh, basically, if you're not confident in your design ability, yep. how do you overcome that? How do you practice and like, how do you get better? That kind of thing. Yeah, there's also another thing that I would say um, to, you know, kind of what we were just talking about, right? There's nothing to say you can't do personal work. Personal work is beautiful, right? If you feel like you're not confident in the work that you're doing, you can make up a project for yourself. Here's the crazy piece. You don't have to tell clients that it's not a real client that you worked for. It's nuts. They don't ever have to know that it was a personal project. You can make a logo for a fake. You're, you're muted. Thank you. Don't lie yeah. about it, but you yeah. don't have to like say, oh yeah, it was just this fun thing I did, you know? Yes. Yes. You don't have no. to like, for example, putting it on your, on your, uh, on your website, you can just put something as simple as self-initiated, right? It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be like, this is a personal project that I did because I didn't have any clients. No, you can just <laughs> simply, yeah. You know, I think you, again, you right. can, you can put it on your website and just say, you know, a simple self-initiated and then go into it like it's an actual project. Because again, a lot of the stuff is just proof of concept. Prove to people that you know what you're doing. Prove to people that you know how to take something from the start of a project to the end of a project and doing it in a professional manner. Right. Um, this, what I'm showing right now is a, this is the contract. So this is a rare occasion when a client brings me a contract, right? right. Um, this project to give you a little background is for a clothing line. Um, that's going to be sold downtown at the mall in a store. It's called From Here. Um, and so they reached out because they're doing partnerships with local artists and stuff like that to design merch that they're going to sell. Um, it's like, I, I believe it's, yeah, it's so it's 750 for a design and then 10% of all sales is what I get as well. well that's yeah. actually not so, bad. No, it's not bad. I, well, and I, again, anytime I could tell you to get things like 10% of sales or 10% of it's, it's great, right? That's passive income. One, you're not doing work anymore, but you're getting a check every month. Um, the more you can get stuff like that, the better. And that's another great example of sweetening a deal long-term. You know, it might be less paying up on the, on the front end, right? 750 might be less than what I would normally charge for designing merch, but the 10% for sales for perpetuity sweetens the deal enough for me that I go, okay, yeah, I'll do right. that. Um, and so this is, I just wanted to show this, right? So this is an example of a client that gave me a, their own contract for me to sign, right? Um, and I, and that's fine. That's a lot of times that's, that's enough. I would say at least have one contract. You don't necessarily have, need to have them send you a contract and you have to send them your contract. It doesn't always have to be that. If you feel you're comfortable with the terms that have been laid out in their contract, you can do that. If you don't, feel free to send them your contract as well and Absolutely. just be double contract up. Um, this happens all the time. It yes. really does. Yes. Um, especially with the bigger, the bigger the clients you start working with, the more likely you'll have them send you contracts. That's, that's what I'll tell you. Um, and then this is something, right? So for me, I do, I print out what I call legit project sheets. Stuff that I like to keep analog paper and I'll show you, right? So I like to keep these sheets that have simple, simple overviews of projects that I have, um, right? What are the deliverables? What's the project title? How much am I being paid? I'll include like if, if I had a percentage that was already paid, like 25% was paid up front, I'll put that on these. Um, I'll have some milestone dates and then I've got, you know, my simple checklist or expenses incurred that I can fill out later. So I know, oh, they owe me some money. Right. Um, so that's just something for me that I really like because it helps me stay organized and understanding, hey, what what money's out there on the table? What projects do I have working on? I can just look at the sheet really quick and go, OK, I remember this project <laughs> and it, it helps the more projects you start taking on. Um, so with this project, right, I was tasked with designing a shirt, 
Um, it was honestly open-ended. They said, whatever products you wanted, right, you could think about, right? So I ended up designing a shirt and then later some socks as well. Um, so concept development, I always typically go, right, notebook, pencil paper first. Um, oh, man, I have sketchbooks up here yeah, on the shelves. Yeah, my- I have so many. I have, a, I have a ton of empty ones as well, right? The beauty of using pencil and paper, especially now that we have like Procreate and stuff, I Procreate is what I illustrate in for all professional work. And then I vectorize in Illustrator. But the problem with those is you will spend so much time undoing and it's a waste of, it's a waste of your time undoing and perfecting a sketch that just needs to be a snippet. Get that idea out. Oh, pixels are very seductive. Things yes. look way more finished on yep. a glowing screen yep. than they actually are. And and the other piece is, is sometimes you can, the unfortunate thing that you might run into with clients is when you do stuff digitally, sometimes they end up feeling like it's the finished product. Yeah. And it's, it's not. not. Showing them showing them a sketch helps them understand and it's scratchy. It's got other artifacts on it and other stuff. Sometimes that's the best because then a client can see, oh, this is just a concept. This isn't the finished product because what I do from sketch to final, it varies pretty differently, right? Um, And sometimes when you do stuff digitally, you lose that and you'll get clients that are like, oh, well, this isn't the same or, oh, that that's not finished. It's like, yeah, I know it's not finished. It's a sketch. So I would just, again, that's one. So, right. Um, I was right. They had the client had a couple ideas. I've worked with them before. So they kind of know my style. They know what I do. Um, they kind of had an avenue that they wanted me to go down, right. Doing a word mark for the city, as well as maybe playing around with some graphic elements and stuff like that. Right. So keep that in mind. So I started chopping around with just different letter forms and messing around with graffiti type and stuff like that. Um, yeah, working in different spaces. And then I started working with like these weird characters because I was thinking graphically like, oh, this might be something fun to do, right? The beauty of it is this is a project in which I get to a lot like my mural projects. I get to just kind of go explore. Um, you know, there's not a very fine and that's not always the case. So understand that sometimes clients have very rigid needs for their projects. This is just one in right. which they basically told me, like I said, they know me, they've worked with me. They go, we want your mind. We want you to go do what you do. And so I'm able to just kind of mess around with a lot of stuff, right? So that's what you're seeing on here. Um, you know, a lot more just different types and symbols. Um, like you'll notice how the spoke, it's like block, it's broken up because I ran out of page because I'm terrible about doing that on pencil That happens paper. all the time. <laughs> yeah, but it's fine. Again, like I said, it's fine. Get the word, get it on the paper so that you can get an idea of what you're looking for. You can fix that post, right? Um, and then again, working on different graphic elements. And some of these sketches are done later in the process and I'll, I'll call back to them later. But um, when we, you know, we decided to go on a different direction, but you'll see just kind of some different imagery, things that I started messing around with. And then I took, right, the example that the client liked the best, right? And I took it into Procreate, got a little more of a based out sketch, right? Again, not perfect. I'm not really worried about form and stuff like that. I'm just trying to get it on paper and get the concept down so that I can go, okay, what do you think of this visually, right? What's your composition? I always start working in black and white and I keep things in black and white until I get it to a point where the client is happy with the composition because color can be seductive as well. You might see something in color that makes it look better than it actually is, but here's the, here's the key. If it looks great in black and white, it's going to look great in color. If it looks great in color, but the composition is bad, sometimes it's not going to look great in black and white and the composition is just bad later. Absolutely. Um, so this was the first version, right? Um, from the sketch. And after I did this, I was like, okay, I'm liking some of the letters that, that are happening here. I'm liking some of the forms, how they're interacting, but some of them I'm not happy with, you know, like specifically like the K or the A, um, things that I just, you know, felt like they weren't, they weren't matched up properly. Like they didn't, they didn't match with the style that I was going with needed to be altered. So then I did another version, just focusing less on the symbols, more on getting the word mark feeling how I wanted it to feel. Um, and you'll notice, you know, changing the K a little so that it feels like it's cohesive with the rest of it, changing the A and taking some of the accents out where they needed to, um, trying to make sure that, right? Like you'll notice, trying to make sure some of the balance feels good, right? So you've got this negative space black here, but also some negative space between the K and the A that kind of balances it on this other side. Those are just some simple things. We can go and talk about type forever. I love type, but- <laughs> That's a this different is, talk. We'll do that's that That's a different time. talk, right? Um, but so that's you know the next step in the process, cleaning up the sketch. Again, we're still still in that concept development stage. 
And then I went and I took that character that was originally the idea that I felt like, oh, this would be really awesome. I think people, you know, the audience would love it. Um, and to give you some insight, right, the audience that I'm specifically designing for is, I would say the way it was voiced to me was like 18 to 35 to 40 year old women was the primary audience that this client works with. And so keep that in mind as you're hearing my initial, my initial idea, right? So this, I was planning on doing, right, the word mark on front and then having on the back, having this like character, having something fun, right? I, I wanted to do some similar to kind of how those thrasher tees can be sometimes where you've got like the thrasher on the front right. and you've got the big illustration on the back, right? Um, so I took this guy in, right? Started sketching. You'll notice, right? I changed things as I'm sketching because his foreshortened arm was really messed up originally. I wanted it to come out further, stuff like that. I didn't even draw legs originally. So like, <laughs> you know, just stuff that you end up doing post, but you don't need it to get the idea down. And that's why I wanted to show you kind of the draw over so you could see how I'll take something from my sketchbook and actually start messing around with it in, you know, a digital landscape. And so from there, right? I'll take something and then start messing around with how do these two interact. I originally was like, oh, maybe I won't have it on the back. Maybe we'll have it interact with the type in some way. We'll just have it all on the front, right? A really fun illustration on the front, right? And so I went through a couple of different iterations, um, showed the client. And this, the funny piece is a lot of the stuff the client didn't see. They only really saw, I believe, this version, right? This second version. And it was just a sketch. And I was like, hey, what do you think of this concept? Do you like this? Is this something? And basically, again, they told me we love the type. I don't really like the character. We don't think it'll fit, right? We don't think it's going to, you know, fits our demographic. Sure. And that was a case in which I felt like, oh, I love the character. I think it's, I think it's well done. I think it's awesome. I really want a shirt like that. But it didn't fit. But again, looking objectively, I was going, I, I truly, I agree. I don't think this demographic would respond as well to this type of shirt as something where we ended up going, which is a little more graphic pattern wise, right? And that's mm. where those symbols you were seeing, like the goat and the marmot and the parkade and stuff, that's where those symbols came into play. Um, and so then I started messing around with those ideas, right? Then I took it back into the sketchbook. So that was all the way, so like these, right? I started messing with patterns um and this one in the top right right is kind of the idea i ended up going with where you'll see the clock and the mouth and the different star and the basketball all that kind of stuff was what i ended up going with um conceptually and so what i ended up doing is i took a lot of those symbols and i draw them on their separate you know panels and then i start building the pattern from there it's the way i like to do it because it lets me separate everything and if i feel like something's not working compositionally i can move it around I just want to and, pause for a second there yeah. and just point out students don't be afraid to be super messy. Yes. And go back to a sketch mode when you're working on stuff. Yep. You, in fact, you have to do that sometimes. Yes, absolutely. A lot of the times the mess is where you find the best ideas. Absolutely. Um, and so again, right. Like I'll take this and if this looks again, it looks awful because I've just stacked everything on top, but really I'm just trying to get a sense of, okay, how do I want this overall blob to feel, right? And then I take it, I sketch it out a little bit more, you know, I'm racing lines, I'm feeling, figuring out how, what things I want in front, what things I want behind, all that kind of thing. Showing the client some different ideas, like, oh, what if we had this? Or on the bottom, what if we just did something up front, right? You take the, you take the type and then have the symbols built around it. So I'm really just thinking right. about just different concepts and then finally coming to the concept that they loved, which was this version. It's going to be tweaked again, but this kind of concept, this idea was what we ended up going with for the final concept, right? And this is what they saw. This is improved. what they saw. I mean, they saw some, they saw some other versions as well. So like they saw these, right? They saw some of these options as well just to try to get a sense of, okay, do we want to do something that's just the front or do we want to just do something that's like just the, you know, on the back with the front being the type, right? But this is yeah. the one that I showed and was like, yep, that's the one we want to go with, right? So from there, I'll start messing with color to just get an idea of, and again, this is where I go and procreate, I'll mess with hue, saturation, all that kind of stuff. Start messing around with, okay, but also the beauty of it is understanding your medium. I'm printing this on a shirt. 
So understanding the different printing techniques is key because you've got to understand that, hey, if they're screen printing, right, we're printing one color at a time. Right. So thinking about it in those terms and also the more colors you print, the more expensive things get. Clients love it when you keep things cheap for them. So think about the concept, right? Think about the idea of, okay, if I can keep this as few colors as possible, the client's going to be happy with me because I just made a an awesome design that also is going to cost them less than doing something that's eight, 10 colors. The worst thing is having a design that you love that's 10 colors. And then after the fact, they go, well, we can't do this. That's thousands of dollars because it's 10 different colors. Right. Yeah. 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 Honestly, the whole color thing is a really important deal in t-shirts, but it's yep. not that that exists elsewhere too. I mean, yeah. I remember doing a design project. This was like 20 years ago. And the, they were like, you know what? We can literally only do one color on paper. That is yep. literally all we can afford. Yep. And but honestly, we came up with some awesome designs within that boundary because we just had to push yeah. in different creative directions. Yep. Limitation can be your biggest helpful like, helper. It really can. Um, you know, the when people put boxes around you, a lot of the times you get some really creative ideas. And that's why I tell you understand those things early and use it early in your process because it allows you to come up with something that's incredible within the limitations. Um, you know, you, that's, that's an excellent, excellent example tour. Cause I, I love telling people about how freeing limitations can actually be. Yeah. Um, and so hey, now uh, we only have like maybe four or five minutes, just time check right? speed round. Right. So basically right. now this is this, the rest of this is pretty simple, right? I take the sketch, the final sketch that I've done. Um, and I'll do like a final pass and procreate i'll draw it out i'll get everything where i want it to be um all of the separate layers so if you're working with something in three color i'll do three separate layers for uh to take into illustrator because it's easier for image trace if you don't take in a massive illustration and yeah. when you take it in image trace um like with different layers so different pieces um it allows you to change the colors of those layers very easily so that you can give an illustrator ready file to a printer um, so that's all this was, right? Taking both of the designs, image tracing, and these ones, right? The front design and back design that are kind of negative out. It's because I did two designs, one that was color and one that was going to be like white on a black shirt. Oh, right. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then from there, I did mock-ups so the client could kind of see, oh, what does the color version look like? What does this actually look like on a, you know, a fake shirt, right? So they can now, we're at the point where we're, we've got a vector, we've got something that we are ready to move on with. They can see, okay, this is, we're happy with this. This is kind of how it'll look. And then I start going to the talks with the actual printer because every printer is different. Different printers have different processes. They like things in different file sizes. There's nothing wrong with asking client, hey, can I get in talk, contact with your printer so that I can make sure I get them the best file that I can. Um, Clients like that actually. Clients huh? really like that. Clients yes, like they, they love it. They don't like having to do that stuff because a lot of them don't understand what the printers are talking about. Um, this is, again, basically all this is, is me getting them the file. The way this printer like to do it is everything is in black, have registration marks, and basically labeling all of your different plates with the colors that you want. Um, some printers like stuff to be in Pantone. Some of them like it to be in CMYK. This client in particular like both, right? Like having both of the information so they could color match to their, to their best. But that's why you're seeing all black. Is because the way they like it, it doesn't it doesn't matter for them. They're just cutting the specific layers out. So that was for the two shirts, and then I also did right the sock designs, and these were these were developed differently by a different printer. So again, a different process. Um, and then finally, right, you've got your finished products. So this is how they turned out, and the the bigger piece is nice. you've got like what I wanted them to be printed on is different than what was available. So in my eyes, right, I wanted, it, that's another thing to consider, right? Sometimes your vision just doesn't fit with the client's budget or it doesn't fit with what's available for the printer. Um, so like the, the black ended up being gray with like a putty colored print. And then the white shirt, we decided to go with like an eggshell. But again, those are kinds of things that you end up working with post. Um, I would have preferred the back design to be larger. The printer that they ended up working with just didn't have a plate large enough to do it that big. Again, these are things that as you work with clients, there's some, something's got to give, right? 
Um, well, that, that happens in uh, print design. I can think of projects where we were counting on using a certain kind of paper stock, like because it had yeah. like a recycled texture to it and it was going to add a certain quality to our printing. And then yep. by the time we got to the printing stage, that paper was either, I can't remember now, it was either no longer available or like there was a shortage and the price was doubled and it was like, we can't afford that. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, I, again, sometimes that stuff happens. Um, but yeah, but that's, again, that's basically it, right? I delivered those print files, those original vectors, these final print vectors to the client in a zip folder. So they have everything that they need um with all the file specifications that they need and then again we're we're good but once i send that stuff out um i'll send out right final invoice with most clients depending on how the project works i'll send out final invoice before i send final files so once you pay me i'll send and it, again it depends yes. it depends on the client you're working with some clients right you can send them the final files and they'll send you right they're you're they're good for it right but there are also some clients that I would say, get your money before they before you send anything final that they can use because there are some dirt bag people in this world, man. Well, and and honestly, if you have a new client who seems like a really nice person, you can be like, you yep. know, I'm sorry, I, I'm I'm I need payment before I send you the file, yep. and it's not you. It's just that I have been yep. burned before, and so exactly. I have to be careful with everybody. And that's again, and that's that's told. I've told so many clients that it's totally fine to voice that. I also want to just point out something. You showed some mockups on T-shirts, and those are yep. like, it, honestly, you can download T-shirt mockups and packaging mockups and all kinds of stuff off the internet. Yep. Feel free yep. to do that for your portfolio, like yes. for, for projects yeah. you're working on, fun things you're doing. Yep. Like it definitely adds a level of professionalism. Assuming you're doing it right in Photoshop, I mean. You yes. still have to make it look good, but yes. that is totally legit. Yep. It's, you can take, again, you can take very simple project, you know, project mockups and stuff off of like creative market and stuff like that, tweak them in Photoshop and have them be ready and feel professional um, without, without a ton of effort. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, Josh, it has been awesome talking to you. Uh, yeah. I believe you have shared a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, thank you so much for your time and your advice. Again, feel free if anybody, you know, finds me on Instagram or anything, ask any questions you feel like I said, I'm an open book and the more we all succeed, the better the design industry is. So amen to that. Feel free to ask. Yep. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody. Have an awesome day. Thank you. Bye, everybody.